Hi, this is Simon with uh, Redis DevSember. Today it is day four, and we are going to be looking at Python uh, today. We're going to be looking at how to develop a Redis application using a new Python client called Redis Ohm. So let's dive straight into that. I'm going to uh, add my desktop here. So if you've missed any of these streams so far, or you want to catch up, or you're wondering what this is, Redis DevSember is a series of very, very short, uh, like 15 or so minute live streams, which we are doing in uh, the month of De December. And we are going to have one live stream every working day for us here in uh, the UK and the US. So that's Monday to Fridays. And then weekends, we are going to do uh, challenges on GitHub. So. Last weekend, uh, my colleague Justin set a challenge on GitHub that you're very welcome to go and try out. Um, it requires minimal Redis knowledge, and you can learn everything you need from watching the, the short streams that we did before. So today, we're going to talk about something that is um, both new and in some ways familiar. So developing applications with Redis in Python is not a new thing. It's been around for a long time. And there's some really good Redis clients to do that. So one of those is called Redis Pi. It's a very well-established client. We have a course at Redis University that teaches you how to use it. And um, it maps very closely to the Redis command interface. So if there's a Redis command, for example, hset, set a value in a hash, there'll be a Redis Pi function called hset. And you pass that a key and a dictionary of the things you want to set in the hash, and it'll go do that for you. So Redis Pi is an extremely good and mature um, low-level client for Redis that does map very, very well onto the Redis commands. So if you know the Redis commands or you go learn them at redis.io, then you will very quickly have a grip for how to develop software with it. So today, what we're going to look at is something called Redis OM, which is a new client that's part of a family of clients for different languages. So we here at Redis have developed these clients. It's kind of our first time developing a, a Redis client, and we wanted to build something that was a little bit higher level. So this actually builds on Redis Pi as a foundation. You can do everything you can do with that. And it adds some new features. So specifically, at the moment, it adds object mapping. So we can declare objects uh, declaratively uh, as classes, and we can map them into Redis hashes and other data structures and we can bring them back out again. We can also perform validation on those, and we'll see how that works. And then at some point later in December, we'll look at the other fantastic feature of these OM clients, which applies to all of the languages, not just Python. And that is the ability to use Redis Search pretty seamlessly to generate an index of data in Redis, and then to have a fluent querying API to search for that. So we might say, find all dogs that are in my adoption shelter where the dog's color is mostly brown and the dog has all four of its legs and it's male dog and it's between three and seven years old. So enabling these sorts of SQL-like queries that you can't normally uh, imagine being possible in a key value store. So the Redis Home uh, client's takeaway is that these are higher level clients that still expose the, uh, the underlying uh, client. So in this case, it's Redis Pi. In the case of the Node.js Redis Ohm, uh, the client underneath is Node Redis, which again is the most popular one. And um, we also have implementations for Spring and .NET that I'm not particularly qualified to talk about, but uh, colleagues will be joining us later in December to talk about those. So I've got a quick example of some code here. So traditionally, we would have written something to a hash in Redis using Redis Pi and we'd have done that using a dictionary. So here I'm creating a connection to Redis. I'm just using Redis on my local machine. And here I've got a dictionary of things that I want to store. So imagine I'm an animal adoption shelter, and I want a really fast website so it's powered by Redis. And I want that fast website to be um, about all of the animals that I have for adoption. So I might store things like the animal's names and species and how old they are and a bit of a description about them and how much they weigh. So people might want to see that sort of stuff on the website and figure, you know what, I'm interested in this dog that you have, Fido, who's three and he's a fantastic dog, he just needs a new home. Something, something happened in his life that he needs a new home. 
So we would create this dictionary here in Python. I've called it Fido. And we would create this uh, Redis client. So we called it R for Redis. And it's a Redis Pi client. And then, as I said before, the, the way that Redis Pi works is it maps very closely to the actual commands in Redis. There's a command called hset, which is all the hash commands begin with Hs. Set means set one or more fields in a hash. So a hash in Redis is a map of name value pairs that's stored in a single key in Redis. It kind of looks like an object in programming languages. So it's a good match for the, the dict up there. And what we're going to do is uh, basically say, I want to store this at a key called adoptables colon Fido. It's a good idea in Redis to namespace your keys so that you can separate out what does what, because it's not a SQL database. There are no tables. All the keys are in one key space. So I'm saying adoptables is my uh, namespace for my animals uh, website. And Fido is the name of the dog. And that will go ahead and save it into Redis. And then when we want to get it back out again, we need to know the command for how do you retrieve all the values in a hash. So that here is h get all. So hash get all, hash get everything. And we just give that a key. So again, I'm using adoptables Fido. And what I can expect to get back is my unadoptable will be a dict that contains the same values that we put into Redis. So if we go ahead and run that, what we'll see is, and we'll make it a little bit bigger. What we'll see is that it saves Fido into Redis as we expected, and it retrieves it back again, and we get all of the values that we put in there. So what does that look in, like in Redis? Uh, as we saw earlier in this series, I'm using Redis Insight, which is a graphical tool for examining Redis and interacting with it. And I'm specifically using version two preview here, which you can download and try. So here I have a hash called adoptables Fido. It's actually the only thing in this database right now. And it contains all of the name values that we would expect it to. So our code worked, we've stored something in Redis. Um, so this is great and there's nothing on the face of it wrong with this. Um, but when we're writing software at scale, we maybe want to have some sort of idea of a schema for our uh, animals and other domain objects. And we might want a sort of object mapping approach, which is more common with, say, a SQL database where you'd expect to use like a, an object mapper ORM product. So if we look at this same code, but redone with Redis OM, oops, we can pull up the right code. And now we'll see it looks slightly different. So we're doing the same things here. I'm going to write an animal to Redis, and it's going to have the same fields that it had before. And I am going to read it back again. So in order to do that, I'm going to actually define what an animal looks like. So rather than having an open-ended dig like we had before that I could have put anything in, we're going to say that an animal is a or an adoptable is a class. And we're going to extend a class called hash model, which is um, something that Redis OM provides that basically says, hey, map this onto a hash into Redis. And then we are going to define each of the fields and give them a data type. So we have a name here, and that's a string, a species, that's a string, an age, that's an integer. Uh, weight is floating point number because we can have fractions of a pound or a kilogram or whatever. Our, our weights are, but we can't have fractions of a year. So we don't care if our dog's three or 3.5, three or four is fine. Um, these models here are actually uh, validatable and they use a common framework called Pydantic for that. So anything you can do in Pydantic, you can kind of do in here. So we could make some of these fields optional. We could make some of them uh, required we could make some of them strictly type checked. So this has to be an email address, or this has to be an integer, not something that coerces to an integer. And when we go and create one of these objects, um, we would get an exception thrown if we did not uh, conform to the required schema. And Pydantic handles all of that. It's a common library, so it's not something we've created new here. We're, we're just adopting best of breed. So in this case, instead of my dict, I now create Fido as an adoptable, and I pass in the expected uh, values. And then what you'll notice here is in the old code, I created a key called adoptables colon uh, Fido. Redis Ohm 
allows you to do this, but it also by default um, creates a primary key for the, in this case, object we want to save. And it's using ULIDs for that, which again is a, a common understood form of ID. So if you want client side created IDs that are guaranteed to be unique, then this client can do that for you. And it doesn't have to do a round trip to the database to get them. So that the PK primary key was generated locally. And then I no longer need to know anything about this, uh, this model in terms of where it's saved in Redis or how. I don't need to know what the command is. I just call dot save on it and it persists it to the data store. Then similarly, when I want to get it out again, I basically use the dot get on the, uh, the class that we created that describes the model, so the schema. And I pass it in the primary key of something. So Fido's primary key dot getting that should get us the same record back that we just put in. So using Redis Ohm here, we have a sort of different higher level approach to this. And as we'll see in future streams, this will then also allow us to uh, define an index and secondary querying um, or secondary index and querying structure over this. That will then allow us to ask Redis questions like, tell me all the dogs that are between three and five years old and between like 20 and 35 pounds in weight. So we can use the power of Redis search from within this client at a very high level with a fluent querying interface. Um, that's not something we'll have time to cover today, but we will do it later in December. So here's code for that. If I then go and run it, so I do a Python demo .py. What we'll see is a couple of things. So first off, we printed the primary key. So this is the ULID that I was talking about that was generated on the client for us. Uh, so we can go generate a load of these and put them in Redis and we know that they won't clash with things that other instances of Redis OM have created. And then when I save Fido, it stores them in the database. And then when I retrieve it, we get back basically the same thing that we have before, except I now have an extra field because it stores the uh, the ULID in the hash as well. So what does that look like in Redis? If I go back to Redis Insight now, switch over here, I now have two keys. So this is the one that we wrote with Redis Py and the hset command. It has all the things in it. This one here, um, the default namespace for this is the module that we were running the code in. So it's uh, been run in the main, so that's why we've got main there. And then adoptable is my model. And then the rest of it is the ULID, the unique ID uh, that we see in the PK field there. And as you can see, I have the same data. So the uh, takeaway from this is that Redis OM is a higher level client that also exposes all of the lower level functionality of the underlying client. It's a series of clients that work in different languages. So if you wanted this functionality and to use this sort of primary key, and you worked in a uh, model where you're writing microservices in say Node and Python and Java, then clients are available for each of those languages as well as the .NET framework. And that sort of is kind of fast, but it concludes our uh, our stream for today. Um, these are meant to be very, very short streams. So if you're interested in learning more about this topic and everything else we're doing in DevSember, please check out the DevSember page at developer.redis.com slash DevSember. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow with another short bite-sized Redis tip. Thanks.